during the last lecture, yeah, we derived uh, this very important property, yeah, <coughs> which is that the visibility is a modulus yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence, and that it was equal yeah, to the modulus yeah, of the Fourier transform of the distribution of the normalized specific intensity over the source. And well, in inversely, I told you, well, it should be possible yeah, to retrieve uh, the normalized intensity distribution when you make interferometric observations yeah, from the knowledge yeah, of the complex degree of mutual coherence. You just make an inverse Fourier transform yeah, and you find the result here. Yeah. Well, last time we applied yeah, this formula many times. And this time, yeah, I just assume the following. Well, here I have uh, only one axis, U. It's a space frequency. So U is defined as a baseline divided by the wavelength. Yes. Here is the visibility, where the modulus of the, we have, no, the visibility, which is the modulus of the, okay. And what I find. A uh, number without unity. Exactly. And what I find, yeah, it's amazing, is that it is equal yeah, to the modulus of the cosine okay, of u. Okay. This is pi times theta. Okay. And now, <coughs> I should like to make use yeah, of this inverse Fourier transform yeah, to find out how it's possible to retrieve yeah, the normalized distribution of the intensity of the source, yeah? So what you assume is that astronomers yeah. made observations, yeah? And they got points like that, yeah? After they try to fit the results, and they find that, whoa, it's in perfect agreement with that, mm -hmm. yeah? So you have some information about this one, and now we should try to get that one. An interesting exercise too, yeah, which is very simple is that if you assume that the source is a Gaussian, has a Gaussian distribution, yeah, what will the visibility be? Yeah? And now you should know or remember when you make the Fourier transform of a Gaussian function, well, it is another Gaussian function. Yeah? And if the width is very large at the beginning, well, the width in the transform plane will be very narrow. Yeah? So, well, it's an interesting exercise, and this is the exercise yeah, that uh, Leo has just made now, and you also, yeah? So I saw that some of you, yeah, already found the, the good answer. Okay, so here, what I represent is exactly this case, yeah? We see here two equally bright stars, and this is the observed visibility, which goes from one to zero. And, well, the visibility is the modulus of the, of the, complex degree of mutual co coherence, so we only see that part, but astronomers yeah, have to be clever enough to say, well, well this is probably yeah, this function yeah, which looks like a cosine, yeah? and it's exactly what was done. Yeah? We introduced there a cosine, and it worked. Well, here is the visibility of two stars which are not equally bright with the same angular separation. So you see that the flux ratio is like 0 0.7 to 0 0.3. So the summation of the two brightness of the stars is still one. So it is a normalized yeah, intensity distribution. And what we see now is that the visibility, yeah, well, doesn't go anymore to zero. Yeah? It goes down to, well, 0.4 about. Yeah? And uh, OK, well, if you get such a data, yeah, well, you have to figure out yeah, what it does represent. Yeah? But it's possible to find the answer. Well, what I showed before yeah, was a, a, long, a single one, one dimension. Now, in practice, yeah, we are looking at the sky, and so we, we are dealing with two dimensions. So <clears throat> here is a case of a pond-like star. And this is uh, the fringes that we see with, uh, you see, visibility equal to one. We see very clearly yeah, the bright fringes and the dark one. Now, this is a double star with a slightly larger separation. Then we see that the visibility decreases. Yeah? 
we still increase the separation here. Visibility is, yeah, gets down to zero. And uh, the last one is an extended source, yeah, which also shows a visibility which is very low. Yeah. Well, <coughs> this is the visibility that you would expect, yeah? When you observe with an interferometer or a two-hole screen, eh, as we did last time, a star in two dimensions, but with a circular disk. Yeah? So now the disk, well, the star is not one dimension, but two dimensions, circular ones. And this shows the visibility. Yeah? And well, it reflects the behavior of a first order Bessel function. And well, at the end of this lecture, you will have the tool, the necessary tool, yeah, to establish yourself that expression. Yeah? So this will be the exercise for next, next time. Yeah? So next time, maybe we'll, I will ask someone else, yeah? maybe a girl. Yeah? There were no, no girls yet at the, at the blackboard, yeah? <laughs> if everybody agrees. But this will be the exercise. But I will give you all the tools yeah, to, to understand how to construct this visibility function. OK, this is typically yeah, some observations made by astronomers with a VLTI, well, of a star, which is, a, you see, an M-type star, so quite cool star. And you see they got such measurements when separating yeah, the distance between the two telescopes. And so what you do in that case, well, they just assumed yeah, that this is a visibility curve due to a uniform disk yeah, in the projected on the sky. So we come back here. So they, sh they think that, oh, this should be the model to account for the observed visibilities. So they know the expression, analytic expression of the function. And they will try to adjust yeah, the theta in that expression to find what is the angular size of the star. So you see, this is an adjustment using a chi-square method. And they found that the diameter, angular diameter, assuming that it's a uniform disk, yeah, is 16.5 milli arc second. Yeah? And this is a classical application of interferometry, deriving yeah, the angular size of the stars. Now, if you, would, if you know the distance of the star, since you know the angular diameter, yeah, you could derive the linear diameter of the star. Yeah? And uh, many estimation of such distances yeah, come from observations made with the Hipparco satellites. And right now, it will be the Gaia yeah, satellite, yeah, which is observing, well, millions, almost one billion of stars yeah, for us at the moment. OK, this is a, well, a 2D view of uh, fringes when resolving uh, more and more a star. And here is a 1D. Uh, 1D representation, and we see that okay, the fringes are just disappearing as we are when we are re re resolving the, the source. Well, <coughs> this expression, yeah, we already established it, yeah, distribution of the intensity, yeah, in the observer plane for the case when the two holes at the same size, yeah. So I1 was equal to I2. Well, here we we you may assume, yeah, when you are using the VLTI that you could use a big telescope with a small telescope, yeah? Make use of two different telescopes with a given angular separation. Then you have to take into account the fact that the size are not the same. And well, this is a nice exercise too, yeah, to make, yeah? You have all the tools, yeah, to, to deal with that situation. Seeing that you have two telescopes which have different sizes, well, the expression of the distribution of intensity in the observer plane yeah, would be as follows. You see that still well, you, you have the visibility of the fringes which appear here. So here it's even worse. You see that well, visibility uh, is almost equal to zero. We don't see fringes here where well, we are just entering, I would say, secondary lobes. Yeah? So visibility appears again. Yeah? So I come back. I come back here. So this is a visibility curve yeah, as a function of the baseline between the two telescopes. Yeah? So at the beginning, we are here, visibility maximum. 
then we go here and here. This, this is the two situations. Then we go to C and uh, maybe, I don't know what it is here, but uh, it is uh, this situation here. So we are almost here, null visibility. And after when you increase the separation, whoops, the visibility comes back again, yeah? So we are here, you see? And after we decrease, and it goes away. Now, when you are fitting a uniform disk, just a few points here are sufficient. Now you could take into account the fact that the star yeah, is not uniformly brightened, but it, it may show a limb darkening effect, yeah? so brighter in the center than at the lobes. Then you need a more sophisticated models. Yeah? And these observations, when the baselines are such big, yeah, will allow you yeah, to determine these parameters of the limb darkening law. So nice application too. Now, so on the, this, is, this will be the subject of the exercise next time. Yeah? But we will show that for uniform disk, yeah, you get a null, in, null visibility when the angular the well, angular diameter of the star is 1.22 lambda over b, where b is a baseline, yeah, the separation between the two telescopes, and lambda is the wavelengths. Okay? So, well, this is an interesting case to adjust baseline so that the visibility yeah, is null. You don't see fringes anymore. Yeah? So, people are doing that with a VLTI. Yeah, they go observe the stars and they try to find yeah, the best separation to get to the nulling. And of course, they are observing stars which are very far away, like Vega. Yeah? So it's, well, seven, eight light years from, from here, and they use VLTI. Now, if you assume that the star would be 10 times closer, yeah, do you agree that the baselines we would need with a VLTI interferometer would be 10 times smaller, yeah? And if the star was 10 times closer to us, well, you don't need such a high angular separation resolution, yeah? so you'd, you'd use smaller baselines, yeah? And now, well, bring the star still closer to you up to the distance of the sun, yeah? Okay, so well, the interferometer gets very, very, very small, yeah? And now, what, what we find, yeah? is that this relation yeah, may be rewritten uh, as shown there. So I just say, OK, uh, I'm trying to find out. Well, and we, we just apply it now for the case of the sun, OK? For the, for the case of the sun. I just say, OK, theta u d is 30 minutes of arc. Yeah, this is the angular size of the sun. In one minute of arc, I have 60 arc second. Yeah? And now I should express this angle not in seconds of arc, but in radians. In radians yeah? So what I need, I need to divide by the number of seconds of arc that you have in one region. And the number is about 206,265 seconds of arc in one yeah, region. So OK. So we find that this is equal to 1.22. The wavelengths, well, typically we are observing in the visible, 5,500 angstroms, so it's uh, 0 0.55 microns. And we divide, of course, by the baseline expressed in micron units. Yeah? So from that expression, we may derive what is the baseline we need to observe the sun and see it. Yeah? with the same system of fringes as astronomers see the fringes when they are observing distant stars with a VLTI. So we find that d mu is equal to 122, 0.55, divided by 30 times 60, and then multiplied by 206,265. And this is a baseline in micron. Yeah? And when you do that, 
you find that the baseline is about 77 microns. Yeah, 77 microns. And so we, <coughs> we have designed yeah, such micro interferometers. We are using uh, well, nanotechniques, yeah? but on this frame, yeah, I have 49 different types of interferometers, yeah? some which correspond to VLTI, well, one which corresponds to uh, two telescope interferometers separated by 77 microns. Yeah? And well, the idea, of course, is to use these interferometers for observations of the sun to get data images then from these images, yeah, well, you will see fringes, of course, yeah, to derive visibilities and just to play with the sun and with micro interferometers as astronomers do with the VLTI and the very distant stars. Yeah. So this is a didactical application. Well, this is made of glass, so I'm afraid yeah, to pass it. And, well, it's very difficult. Yeah. One has to to see the sun, yeah, to, to see the fringes. What, what we designed yeah, is just um, this platform yeah, to position the interferometers and move them yeah, upside down or right, left. Then put this on a camera, photographic camera, looking at the sun and taking images of the fringes yeah, seen by the different interferometers. Yeah. So if we have some time during uh, the practical work, yeah, one could try to observe the sun yeah, with uh, this instrument. Okay, now I, I spoke about the baseline, yeah? so 77 micron, yeah? but now we still need two telescopes. Yeah? So what should be the size of the, yeah? of, the, of the mirror of those telescopes or of the lens? Yeah? Well, it should be much smaller than the baseline because otherwise a single a single hole yeah, would resolve the, the sun. Yeah? So we designed uh, holes with a size of 7.2 for some interferometers and others with a size of 14.4 microns. Now the field of view, yeah? the field of view of uh, one such uh, micro telescope yeah? would correspond in the first case to 7.8 degree and in the second case 3.9 degrees. Yeah? So if you take yeah, <coughs> this set of interferometers and you just isolate in one hole the sun, you see it with an angular extension of 7.8 degrees. Yeah? So you don't resolve it because the angular size of the sun is only half a degree. And of course, well, the telescope is too small. But now the idea is, is to use uh, two telescopes separate them by yeah, a certain distance. And then you, you start seeing fringes with a variable contrast as the distance increase. Now I show you well historical photograph. This is the first time I tried to make a picture of the sun with this uh, technique. And well, in this case, uh, the holes were 12 microns about, and separation between them, 29.4. And you see, well, here we see the fringes. Well, now the airy disk is probably uh, something like that, more or less, yeah? So this is a field of view due to a single hole. These are the fringes. And you see that this is a zero order fringe because it's all white. Yeah, so it's good for all the wavelengths. But as we go to first order, n equal 1 or n minus 1, we see that the fringes are dispersed. Yeah? You see here it's bluer, you're redder. And it's normal because in, in principle, we should do that experiment in monochromatic light or quasi-monochromatic light. Yeah? And in fact, it was done in well, white light. And therefore, you see the dispersion. But it works. Now, I shall show you. Well, another type of, well, just a few examples of interferometer that we, we constructed here. It's composed, you see, of many, many, many small telescopes, each with a size of 14 micron. And, well, a typical separation of 50 micron. 
And this uh, design yeah, of an optical interferometer was proposed by Antoine Labéry, but he wanted to use, uh, well, telescopes of 1.5 meter in diameter, yeah, well, uh, just uh, set along the ring. And so what, what we did here, we just uh, took our microinterferometer and looked at the point-like source, and this is what you see. You see? So you see, this is what you could call the point spread function, yeah? But it's what you see for a point-like star, yeah? After, what you could do, use this one, yeah, to look at the sun, and we did that. I think the next picture is... A, so you see, we used it now on the sun. And now what, what you will see, what we'll understand next time is that by deconvolving this image with the previous knowledge of the point spread function for a point like star, yeah, you may retrieve yeah, all the information about the sun distribution of light. Yeah? But I will say more about that next time. Uh, I have a question. Yes? In the center, it's mm -hmm. the image of the star. Well, okay, yeah. Now, <coughs> exactly, this is a critical point. Well, th this mask, yeah, is not perfect, yeah? yeah? The opacity, yeah, is not total, yeah? So, well, when you, when you look at the sun, you may see through, yeah, this component, yeah, the direct image of the sun, yeah? Mm -hmm. And w what you see here is the direct image of the sun, okay? Yeah. And so what we are designing right now is such a mask, yeah, but which are totally opaque. And then you will not see any, any longer in the direct image of the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is a defect, yeah, to the manufacturing of this, of this mask. But, okay, this is another configuration for an interferometer, yeah. And some, some of you have already seen yeah, the very large array made of radio telescopes, yeah. They are configured in such a, in such a way. And when here would be, a, well, the information you would get when observing a point-like star, one could show that in the center, yeah, you get a central image, which is a width, angular width, equivalent to that given by a single radio telescope having that size, yeah? So having a, a diameter equivalent to the most distant, well, the, the greatest distance between the two most separated radio telescopes. Okay, here is a view of the sun using that, that interferometer. And now, well, these are just a few pictures I show you uh, of uh, some experiments that you could do uh, when using a telescope. You could use the same technique yeah, with um, appropriate masks to observe stars, to observe Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, yeah? And uh, you would not be using uh, microinterferometers, but rather mini-interferometers, because the baselines would be one, two, three millimeters. And try by that technique yeah, to determine yeah, the angular size yeah, of the planets. So here, what I show it uh, with well, some experiments that we did with an 80 centimeter telescope in Haute Provence Observatory. So we designed, uh, well, many masks you see, with holes, with different separation. Sometimes we even took some slits, yeah, to increase uh, the collecting area of the light. And uh, we just observed, uh, so here is another, another view on those masks. And then we use some of them to observe, well, here is Procyon. So this is a star. And, well, you may see here the fringes with a visibility uh, equal to one, in fact, if you measure the visibility. After, well, we look at Mars. Here you see the baseline is 12 millimeters. Then Saturn, well, well, I, I see some fringes here. It's very difficult to see them. Yeah, with a separation of two millimeter. In fact, the contrast here, visibility is one. Then after we increase the baseline, 12 millimeters, and you see here, and when we measured the visibility, the visibility was dropping down, showing that we were resolving Mars, yeah? Yes? Uh, 
do we have a uh, software model that will tell that this much will be the visibility if we are taking these many goals? Suppose we are taking two goals. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So this will be the subject of this lecture and of the next time lecture to show you how to establish those expressions. So we will derive those. Yeah. Okay, now this is a view, historical view, of the first ever built interferometer by Antoine Laberry in Calerne. Yeah? So Calerne is an observatory near uh, Nice in France, south of France. And uh, in 1976, yes, he just succeeded in uh, constructing the first optical interferometer made of uh, two telescopes, 26 centimeter in size, with a separation, the baseline is 144 meters. Yeah? So a very big separation. And uh, well, it was a very difficult experiment, yeah, because he just worked with a few engineers, a few astronomers, and he got fringes, yeah, on uh, Vega, on uh, many other stars, yeah. Now, I will let you know about the difficulty of observing, yeah, with a, an optical interferometer. So, here are the two telescopes, you see, and then let's assume that you're observing a star, yeah, in that direction. So what happens is that during the observations, yeah, the star is moving. The star is moving. Yeah. Okay, now the wavefront is perpendicular yeah, to the light rays. And what you see is that when this wavefront hits this telescope, yeah, it is still to travel that distance yeah, to hit the second telescope. And well, if you want to let the two beams interfering, it's impossible. Yeah, because the difference in the path length yeah, should be less than about one, two microns. Yeah? So you have to compensate for that, okay? I will explain you now how. Okay, now, what is the difference of distance between uh, the arrival of this wave from here and there? Well, we see that it is this distance, and this is simply the projection yeah, of the baseline yeah, on that direction. Now, if this is theta, yeah, well, you just find that <coughs> the time difference or the path difference yeah, is d times sine theta. And because theta, which is a zenith distance, varies as a function of time, this varies. Yeah? So you have to compensate for it, yeah, but, well, online, yeah, directly. So what you do, you design what is known as a delay line. Delay line yeah? So you see that, okay, this beam, is first reflected on the big mirror, then goes on the secondary, then goes on this mirror, this mirror, that one, 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 yeah? So you have at least 10 mirrors, yeah? And now you see that the distance yeah, between uh, these mirrors and uh, the last mirror here is not the same. And it's just exactly for compensating, yeah, this Path difference. So what happens is that during the observations, these mirrors will move as a function of time in one direction or in the other direction, yeah, to compensate for that path difference. So this is known as a optical delay line, yeah, optical delay line. And this goes very fast, yeah. The mirror mo moves really in real time, something like that. It's very fast. So you see the difficulty, yeah? So this is an image of the first fringes obtained by Antoine Laberry on the Vega. So you see here, the hairy disc, and then we see fringes. And then, well, he succeeded in measuring the visibility and derived yeah, the angular diameter of Vega, yeah? And this was a very uh, important result. I remember it was published in Nature, yeah? And, uh, well, it was very impressive. So this was his first laboratory, shown picture taken on a 1975. So of course, well, in the ground, yeah, you had the delay lines, yeah, just to compensate yeah, for this path difference. After that, they constructed yeah, the 
grand interferometer à deux télescopes, which means a big interferometer with two telescopes, each having a size of 1.5 meter, which allowed them yet to observe much fainter stars. And well, if some of the students next year yeah, will choose, I mean, for the first master, your students, yeah, to go to Calern, yeah, uh, for one week of observations, yeah, which is really something fantastic, yeah, uh, you may still see uh, this interferometer, it's still there, yeah, you may visit it, yeah, and uh, it's very impressive, yeah. Okay, now the the dream of Anton Laberry yeah, was to build a bigger interferometer made of, a, well, at least you see a four or five or even more 1.5 meter telescopes. But I think it was just uh, lacking, you know, well, the proper team to do that because you need many good engineers and many people. And, well, it never happened. But he really influenced a lot, yeah the decision at ESO yeah, to construct at the European scale an interferometer. Yeah? And so there is no doubt that the success obtained by him yeah, was a, a very good drive yeah, for the construction of the VLTI in Chile. So here you see uh, the four UTs, so four eight meter telescopes. Uh, so there are bases yeah, between them which are fixed. You cannot uh, move the eight meter telescopes. But <coughs> people have thought about adding smaller telescopes. Yeah? So you see there are four smaller telescopes, which are known as being the auxiliary telescopes. And their size is 1.8 meter in diameter. And uh, what, 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 what's quite uh, nice is that they were constructed here in Sartinement yeah? by Amos, the company, advanced mechanical and optical systems. So the four very high technology yeah, telescopes were constructed here in Liège. And they have the properties that they can be uh, moved along the rails yeah, very easily. So you may change their configuration yeah, whenever you want. And we, we have seen once we were visiting a Paranel when they were uh, moving the four telescopes. Yeah, it's uh, very nice to be seen. This is still another view. And the maximum baseline, yeah, can, which can be achieved, yeah, is something like 200 meters. And here you see uh, where the beam of light, beams of light are transported. Yeah? And here is a lab where they are interfering, yeah? in, where, in which you have the delay lines yeah, to allow for those interferences. Delay line <coughs> they are underground, and I will show a picture of the optical delay lines here. So another view of Paranal, yeah. So it's the, the summit, yeah, the four UTs telescope with the auxiliary telescopes. Still another view from an airplane. No? So I, I remember a few years ago when they were just being constructed in Amos and uh, where the students were going there and visiting and uh, seeing uh, those telescopes. Very, very high tech, yeah? Okay, here is a, a view which shows uh, locations of the four UTs and all the possible stations which may be occupied uh, yeah, by the four smaller telescopes. And then, of course, you may design many different baselines, orientation, uh, lengths of the baselines, yeah? And this is a view of the optical delay lines. So you see <coughs> these are mirrors, yeah? Which are just moving, uh, yeah, on uh, some rails with a very, very accurate, yeah, velocity because the difference in the path lengths, yeah, of the two beams can never be larger than one or two microns. So it's, uh, well, the telescopes are moving, the delay lines are moving, and still, yeah, you know that the path length difference, yeah, is smaller than typically two microns. So this is a view 
Yeah, these are the mirrors. Yeah, so the beam goes in one and then comes back through the other one. Now let, let's assume that I'm just considering here the telescope one, two, three, four, and you see all the different baselines that you may construct yeah, from these. For instance, I'm just taking a, from one to two. Yeah, you see. Yeah, from one to two is shown here in the UV plane as this vector. Yeah? So UV means, uh, well, B over lambda, yeah? but with a direction. Yeah? So the module yeah, of this red arrow is B. Yeah? Then you divide it by lambda. And then you may plot it in a UV plane. Well, now, if you look at the yellow arrow here, well, you see that it is here. Yeah. And vice versa, because you may consider it this way or that way, of course. Yeah. And what is the idea yeah, is that you try yeah, to cover the UV plane yeah, as much as you can. And when it is covered, well, you may apply the inverse yeah, Fourier transform that we have seen to retrieve the real flux distribution of the source. Yeah. So it's a... Uh, well, here we just made it with a model, yeah, but what you could assume is that, well, you know this quantity for an infinite val infinity, uh, values of u, and then, well, you may, you may just get the intensity distribution without a model, yeah? So you get the real source image, but with an angular resolution, which is equivalent, yeah, to a single dish with a diameter equal to the largest distance between the two most separated telescopes. Now, how is it possible yeah, to populate yeah, very densely the UV plane? Well, this is achieved yeah, thanks to the rotation of the Earth. Yeah? And this you may see here. Yeah? So let's assume that yeah, you are the star. Yeah? So you should feel like a star. Yeah? And you see on the Earth, yeah, the interferometer here. And you must think in terms of the projection of those baselines on the plane of the sky, OK? Now the Earth is rotating. So you see that those baselines are changing in length and in orientation, you see? And so, well, as a function of time, yeah, you take visibilities, 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 and then you're just uh, populating the UV plane, and then you get enough information yeah, to retrieve yeah, information of the source. So this is very nice. Now, this is what the diagram shows you. Yeah? Uh, it's a UV coverage. Yeah? If you are a star located at the declination of minus 15 degrees, and that you let the Earth yeah, spinning during the night. And this is a UV plane, so you see how you are covering with many, many points. Yeah? This is for a star located at the declination of minus 65 degrees. You see how you may cover the UV plane, yeah? just using uh, well, the four UTs. Yeah? Now, just for your information, Let's assume that you are observing in the sky such a source, yeah, which has a very complex structure, you see. Yeah? It's made of one, two, three, four, five components. Let's assume now that you are just using four telescopes during six hours. Then you may show that using, while using the four UTs, this will be the UV coverage. And now by taking yeah, the inverse Fourier transform of the visibilities. This is what you will find. This is a reconstructed image. When you compare the two, well, you see this one is complex structure. Well, you detect that one. You detect that one. Maybe that one. But there are many other candidates, so you don't know really what is real, what is not real. Whether if you allow yeah, to use uh, eight telescopes, yeah, four UT, four ATs, four auxiliary telescopes, four unit telescopes, during six hours, well, then you, are, you have a better sky coverage in the UV plane. And this would be the image that you could retrieve. 
And now if you compare it yeah, to the original one, you say, wow, it looks very good. Yeah? Yeah? Suppose we are observing a new uh, object. This is a new object. OK, so how do we know that it is close to this? How do we construct this model? This model, and we are comparing. And now, see, no. So, forget that this is a model. Let, let's assume this is a real observation, the real object you observe on the sky. Okay? That's what I'm saying. If yeah. someone is through that uh, interferometry, we are observing a very new star that is not being yeah. observed. So, how do we know that these many telescopes are needed? Optimal number of telescopes. Yeah. Are so, you agree that where the complexity of the source is uh, rather high? Yeah. And what it shows you is that if you are using eight telescopes during six hours, you will be able to retrieve the complexity on that source. Yeah? So if the source is less complex, yeah, no problem. Yeah? Now, if the, if the source is even more complex, maybe you will need more hours. Yeah? So what you do... Which low? Excuse me? Which, which low? Oh, you don't have a low, no. because a priori you don't know. So what you do, first you make six hours, you look at the images, yeah? And if you see, well, it's a double star, you don't need more time, OK? Now if you see that, well, it's a triple star, it's OK. Now if you see, well, it's a double star with a, something diffused like a galaxy, then you may decide, well, if I want to see more details, I have to, to spend more time and try. Yeah? But you don't know a priori. You don't know. So what? Well, well, yeah, so what, what many people do, yeah? Yeah, well, I just give as an, as an example, yeah? In 1989, when we tried to, to find whether some of the known gravitational lenses, yeah, were emitting the radio, yeah? We went to the VLA, yeah? And we didn't know if they were radio sources or multiply image, nothing, yeah? And so we decided, yeah? to spend on each source 10 minutes. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. And then we were looking at those which showed a complex structure. Well, if it was just a point, then we stop. A point, we stop. A point, we stop. Oh, two points. Oh, we come back, and now we, we spend half an hour. And now if we see, oh, we see now three components, yeah? We say, OK, let's spend even one more hour, yeah? So you decide. Uh, there is no rule because you don't know a priori. It could be extremely complex, extremely complex, and then you would need a lot of time. Yeah? But very often it's not so complex. Yeah? OK. OK, now there are other examples of interferometers. This is a Shara interferometer located on Mount Wilson. Uh, in, uh, so Mount Mon Mon Wilson yeah, is uh, near Pasadena in California. And this, this was a 2.5 meter telescope used by Michelson, yeah? Well, as a first interferometer, yeah? You remember to re resolve the Alpha Orionis? And they decided, yeah, to construct an interferometer there made of six, six telescopes. Now, these telescopes have a size of one meter in diameter. But the maximum baseline of 330 meters, yeah, which is larger than 200 meters at VLTI. Now at the VLTI, what I didn't say is that they are only observing now in the infrared. No optical observations. Yeah? And the reason is that, well, it's much more difficult to observe in the optical than in infrared. Because um, if you observe in, uh, at optical wavelengths, the difference between the path lengths of the beams that you would like to make interfer interfering yeah, should be much less than y micron. Yeah? So it's much more difficult. But here they are working optical, yeah? and they have a much bigger baselines. They also have, right now, adaptive optic systems to get rid of the turbulence effects. Yeah? And so it's a very, very uh, efficient tool. And well, m many people in, in my team, yeah, Olivier Absil um, and well, Denis Lefrère and so, are frequently using this optical interferometer to make observations. Yeah? So they go there once or twice a year, and they're really getting very good data. This is another view yeah, of this uh, Shara uh, interferometer. 
And here inside, you have the delay lines. Yeah? So big optical lines, the delay lines, and they are even in the vacuum. They are operating in the vacuum. Yeah? So now, unfortunately, yeah, quite often, yeah, they have uh, the woods which are burning. Yeah? You just heard about you know, fires yeah, in California. Yeah? And, uh, well, the, the fire even came very close to the interferometer, but the fireman came and uh, could avoid uh, the telescope destruction. This is another example of an optical interferometer near the Palomar telescope. This is the dome of the 5-meter Palomar telescope. So you have here uh, three small telescopes. It was called so the Palomar Tesbet interferometer, just 40 centimeter telescopes with a maximum baseline of 110 meters, and they were used yeah, to prepare a space mission, space interferometric mission, so to, to debug the system. But the mission never took place. Yeah. This is a cake, cake interferometer, composed of twice, yeah, two, well, two telescopes with a 10 meter diameters, and with a fixed baseline of 85 meters. Yeah. And thanks to the big size of the mirrors, yeah, they could observe uh, extragalactic objects like active galactic nuclei. Yeah? Well, also with a VLT, of course. Yeah? Now the other slide show you underground, yeah? well, the labs, yeah? where you also have the delay lines, yeah? instruments, you know, very high technology things. Now here, I'm just going to say a few words about nulling interferometry. Yeah? What, what, what nulling is? Yeah? Well, you agree that if you are observing yeah, a bright star with an interferometer, and we look uh, in the focal plane, we see a system of bright and dark fringes. Huh? Now, let's assume that close to the stars, you have a planet, a small planet. Yeah? So very, very faint planet. So typically the planet will be one million or even one billion times fainter than the star. Yeah? Of course, yeah, if you make this, such an observation, you will not see the companion. Impossible. You will see the light due to the bright star. Yeah? So the idea is how to extinguish the light from the bright star. Yeah? Now, when we are working in the constructive mode, yeah, with an interferometer, so the light waves arrive, interfere, and, but in a constructive way. Yeah? You agree in the center, both amplitudes yeah, are just in phase, yeah? and therefore we see a bright fringe. So someone thought, well, if you would introduce yeah, half a wavelength difference between the two paths, well, one wave would go in opposite direction, yeah? And so it will be a dis destructive interference, this destructive interference, yeah? And this is what is achieved here, you see? They are placing the, the star in the dark fringe, yeah? So the light of the star is extinguished, and now you see that the planet, yeah, is on the bright fringe. So it gives you an opportunity, yeah, to make the detection. Now to make sure that, oh, it's a real planet that I have detected. What you can do is just to let your, your screen with the two holes rotating in one direction or the other. And in that case, what would happen is that uh, well, the companion yeah, should have its light modulated by the fringes. Yeah? The companion will not move. Yeah? Just the fringes will move. Yeah? So you, you agree. If, Everything is moves around the companion, yeah? Well, in the recorded intensity, yeah, you will see a modulation. And so if you, if you see the modulation, you can see, okay, I have a, probably detected something, yeah? So it's a technique, yeah, which is being used. Yes? You detect uh, the planet, but, uh, which, uh, but uh, what about uh, the size of the planet? What about the size of the planet? Information about the uh, the angular resolution, the angular, uh, yeah. angular, angular. Yeah. Yeah. So probably, yeah, this is a good question. Probably you will not resolve the planet. Yeah. Well, what you will know is that 
I have detected a companion, but you don't know what it is. So what people would plan to do then is to make a spectrum, take a spectrum. And from the spectrum, they would know, OK, maybe it's a star companion, or maybe it's a reflection of light by the planet. Yeah? But because well, the star is such a big, and the planet is such small, that you don't have the angular resolution. Yeah? Now, of course, I mean, uh, this is also a dream of Anton Labéry. Yeah? Well, he is a real precursor yeah, in that field. He already uh, proposed a long time ago to ESA uh, to fly, well, a network of, uh, of uh, small telescopes yeah, in space. So a fleet, yeah, a fleet of telescopes, small size with very big separations, yeah, to have such a high angular resolution that you could detect the planets, yeah. But it would be so expensive, yeah, so expensive. And uh, well, interferometry in space, even with two single telescopes, has never been demonstrated because you need uh, to allow two spacecraft, yeah, to fly in parallel, yeah. And uh, with, when accurately well, monitoring the distance yeah, and keeping it very, very stable. And this has not been demonstrated yet. Yeah. But there are missions which are planned to do that. Uh, I have a very simple question. Yeah? Suppose the planet is not there. Yeah. And you are made, means you made that instrument uh, to do destructive interference. So, you will see if it is right. Yes. But then, uh, how will you know that uh, planet is there or not there? How, how do you differentiate? If planet is not there, we see the same thing as... Oh, uh, as I said, yeah? So everything which is on the dark fringe is not detected. Anything which is on the bright fringe is detected, yeah? So what, what you do, you just let your two telescope, yeah, turn in space like that, yeah? So the fringes will move like that, yeah? And so the planet signal will be modulated by that rotation. And so if you see a modulation with the same period as uh, the one due to the rotation of the fringes, you know that there is something there, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And now, and now if you have a disk, yeah? Let, let's assume there is not a companion, but a disk of matter. When you will rotate it, yeah? The frequency will be twice higher. Yeah, because uh, yeah. you have both sides. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, well, I just passed. Now, just this slide to let you know that interferometer are not uh, restricted only to the infrared, yeah, and to optical wavelengths, but also in the now submillimetric and millimetric wavelengths. And a good example, yeah, is the Alma interferometer. Well, it is a joint venture yeah, between uh, ISO, uh, then uh, NRAO, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, yeah? then uh, Japanese astronomers, and also Canadian, Ca Canada astronomers. Yeah? And well, it's typically composed yeah, of about 60 telescopes now, which have a size of 12 meters in diameter. Yeah? And while well, they already have provided yeah, excellent images, yeah? images, yeah? Of a, of a disk of matter around stars and yeah, showing uh, how planets are being formed. Yeah, so it's very impressive. Yeah. No, no. Okay. Now, these telescopes here yeah, are observing in the millimeter sub millimeters, which means that the accuracy yeah, of the mirrors yeah, is of that order. Yeah. So it's not uh, like an optical telescope. So not, not even infrared, far infrared. No, it's a millimeter, exactly. So it's typically, uh, I would say, one millimeter and one tenth of a millimeter. Yeah. And then how do they uh, do the delay? Uh, yeah, by optical fibers. Same, same principle? Yeah, by using optical fibers. And uh, here in this case, uh, they don't have uh, optical delay lines, as we were telling, but it's made electronically. Electronically. It's the same principle as the radio telescopes. As the radio telescopes, yeah, absolutely. Therefore, NRAO, yeah, National Radio Astronomy Observatory, 
is involved in that business is because uh, there's a knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Now, well, <coughs> the telescopes are located yeah, at, at an altitude of about 5,000 meters. Yeah? So it's a, on a very high whole plateau in Chile. And uh, the air is very dry. And therefore, because the humidity is so low, they can observe in millimeter, submillimeter. If you go even at an altitude of 3,000 meters, you cannot go through the water vapor because it will absorb all the radiation. But at those altitudes, yeah, they are successful. So this is a very powerful experiment. And now, as I said before, yeah, many, many propositions have already been submitted here yeah, to set a space interferometer. Well, even, I mean, uh, one of my students, Olivia Psyd, yeah, did his PhD yeah, on the Darwin project, which was a ESA flag project to install a, a space interferometer. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm definitely convinced yeah, that in the next decade, yeah, where some experiments will be put in space to make interferometry, but at the prototype level. Yeah? So it will not be a, such a big project, but probably two small mirrors on two spacecrafts and uh, let the light interf interfering. But I'm sure that uh, this will be a project for the near future, not the long term future, but for the near future. But everything is prepared already. Everything was ready at NASA and also at ESA, but uh, the cost was the uh, main difficulty. And now new technologies yeah, are being developed and uh, the prospect to have such a future space missions is much, much higher. Okay, now just a summary. So just remember that a long time ago, yeah, before Galileo, yeah, people thought that the angular size of the stars yeah, was about two arc minutes. Yeah? And then when Galileo made that experiment yeah, with a wire, yeah, just uh, set behind a star and uh, adjusting the distance, it could derive that it was of the order of uh, five seconds of arc. What he didn't know is that it was that he was measuring the thin disk and not the angular diameter of the stars. Yeah? Then came a Newton yeah, with, a, well, with a very good uh, proposition, theoretical proposition, to say, well, let's imagine that the sun is just a star. How far away should we place it? Yeah? So that it would look as bright as the Vega. And he found the distance and said, well, but at that distance, instead of having 30 arc minutes, it would be much smaller. And he found about two mini arc seconds. Yeah. Then came um, Fizeau and Stefan, yeah, based upon the idea of the young interferometer. And they, they just tried to measure angular diameters, you remember, with the 80 centimeter Marseille telescope and they could not resolve any star, yeah? And they just did use that the angular diameter of the stars was smaller than 0.16 second of arc. Then uh, came Michelson, who could measure the angular size of the Galilean satellites using a small telescope, 26 centimeter. And finally, well, they used a seven meter interferometer and resolved for us yeah, the angular diameter of Alpha Orionis, yeah? And, well, Michelson and Pease yeah, resolved five more stars with their experiments. They tried now with a beam of 14 meters, but it didn't work, yeah? But then after came Antoine Aberry, yeah? And uh, so from uh, Calerne in France, yeah? Made uh, many angular diameter estimates, yeah? So you see here uh, was the accuracy. Yeah? It's typically plus or minus one milli arc second. So these angular diameter are very small, yeah? three, uh, eight, four. Now when you know the angular diameter, as I said before, if you know the distance, then you may deduce a linear diameter. But if you know the angular diameter and the bolometric flux of the star, you may derive the effective temperature. And these are 
yeah, effective temperature yeah, that they have derived for all those stars. And they just turn out yeah, to be the best temperature estimates astronomers can make. Yeah? Much better than by any other method. Okay, and now we should, we should just uh, make a break now, 15 minutes. And after, I will, uh, well, we will do some theory, yeah? because now you have relaxed, yeah? so you are ready yeah, to, to digest a few equations. So we will see the fundamental theorem, which is, you will see, a very important, nice theorem. Uh, useful to understand what you said, yeah? How to, to model, yeah, the observations for the case of a point-like star or for a resolved star, yeah. So, the fundamental theorem So what we are going to demonstrate here yeah, is the following. So let's, convert, let's consider a converging system, optical system, yeah? complex, yeah? made of uh, many, many lenses, yeah? not just one converging lens, but of, of many. And what uh, we shall demonstrate, yeah? is the following. Well, here is a pupil plane. So the plane yeah, just in front of the pupil of the optical system. And here is the focal plane. And what we will de demonstrate is that the distribution of the complex amplitude of the electric field in the focal plane is just the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Okay, so the distribution of the complex amplitude in the focal plane is given by the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the entrance pupil plane. Yeah? So this is the, the subject of this part. Again, here is the optical diagram. And of course, there are many assumptions behind this. Yeah? So first assumption is that we are looking at a very distant source which is point-like, emitting, emitting monochromatic light. The light is polarized yeah, along the one direction. The frequency is new as before. Yeah. Now, I assume also that between the pupil and the source, well, any variation of the wavefront, affecting the wavefront, yeah, will have a, a frequency which is much longer than the period yeah, of the radiation I'm considering. After I will assume that when the light enters a converging optic, optic system, there is no loss inside. Yeah? So there is no absorption, yeah? no, no problem due to the reflection, reflection 100%. Yeah? So what else? Maybe I have forgotten some of the assumptions, but maybe they will come to my mind when I will make the demonstration. But these are the main ones. Yeah. So let's assume yeah, that light rays from the converging system yeah, converge into a point N in the focal plane. So for very complex optical systems, yeah, what people do is they define the two principal planes yeah, and the intersection of these two optical planes, yeah, labeled P and P prime, yeah, with the optical axis, yeah, the two principal points are H and H prime. Yeah? Now, in the case of a single optical lens, yeah, H and H prime are the same point, and they, they correspond to the center of the optical lens. Okay? So if you have a simple optical lens, yeah, H and H prime yeah, are the same, and they correspond to the optical center of the, of the lens. It means that light ray yeah, passing through H comes out following the same direction. Now, if the two points are similar, well, it corresponds to the optical center of the lens because uh, the light ray is not deflected at all. Yeah? OK, so what I know yeah, is that well, the focal length of my system is the distance between H prime 
in this plane, of course, it's f focal, focal length. And if this is a ray converging in n, I know that before it's parallel. It means that all the light rays converging into n yeah, come from a parallel beam of light rays here. Okay? Okay, now let's define the position of the point N with coordinates. It will be along this axis X prime, along that axis Y prime, and along the Z axis I will say, okay, well, it's just the, the distance between H prime and the focal plane, it's F. Yeah? Now let's go into the pupil plane. So this is the entrance plane of our optical system. And what I try to, to define is that the, what is the distribution of the complex amplitude in this plane, which is x, y. Yeah? And I would say z is equal to 0. Yeah? So the coordinates along that direction here is 0. So as I said, yeah, the light rays before entering the optical systems are parallel yeah, to that one. So here they are represented. And here is a light ray coming directly from the reference point yeah, O here. Now this is another one which is parallel. And wh what I know is that the wavefront, yeah, since it comes from a source at an infinite distance, yeah, the wavefront is perpendicular to these two rays, of course. Yeah. And it is symbolized yeah, by this line, yeah, which belongs yeah, to the wavefront. And, and what I directly see is that where well, there is a path difference yeah, between these two rays, which is just the distance here, since this is a wavefront. Yeah, so of course, this is the path length difference between the two rays, two light rays. Now, well, how to define, this is a unit vector, U, oriented in that direction. How could I define its coordinates? Well, it's very simple. And here I will switch on the lights. I know that this vector U yeah, is the same direction as these lines, H prime N. So I know that the coordinates, there will be something like X prime, Y prime, and F. So this is x, y coordinates, and this along z. Yeah? So x prime, y prime, and z. Now I would like to represent it as a unit vector. So what I need to do, well, it's OK, the module of u should be equal to 1. And now well, I see that it's equal to the square root of x prime square plus y prime square plus f square, like this. Well, I may rewrite this as follows. Yeah? I, I can say, well, it's about equal to f multiplied by the square root of 1 plus x prime square plus y prime square divided by f square. Now, I shall assume yeah, that I shall assume that the distance, yeah, x prime, y prime are much smaller than the focal lengths. Yeah? So it means that, well, I'm just considering points very near to the origin, and their distance is very small yeah, compared to the focal lengths. Yeah? So I could say, OK, this is about equal to 0, yeah, because it's a second order. And I find that, well, the module yeah, of that vector, I, I, I could call it uh, R, yeah, is, equal, is about equal to F. Yeah? So if I want to define a unit vector along that direction, I just have to divide these coordinates by f, and I find that it will be x prime over f, y prime over f, and f over f is 1. And indeed, if I take now the module yeah, of that vector, I find that it's the square root of 1 plus second order terms. Yeah? So it's about 1. Okay. So I found uh, the coordinates of that unit vector here on this diagram. Now, I would like to know, yeah, what is uh, 
the difference along the path length of these two rays. So what I do, look, I just project this distance yeah, on that vector, yeah, because it's a, a cosine. Yeah? <coughs> so I needed to make uh, the scalar product of OM times the U vector. And this is the difference in path length. Yeah? So delta yeah, is, its, is this length. So I just project this one on this one. <coughs> and what I find, well, OK, now the coordinates of the vector OM is x, y, x, y, and z equals 0. Yeah? Now, when calculating the scalar product, I'm just adding the product of the coordinates, yeah? and I find that it is x, x prime divided by f plus y, y prime divided by f. Okay? So it means that the phase difference, yeah, when these two rays will arrive in n, yeah, will be equal to what? It will be the phase difference, it will be phi, equal to pi, multiplied by delta over lambda, so which is equal to 2 pi, multiplied by x, x prime, over f lambda plus y y prime over f lambda. Okay, so this is already uh, something important. Any questions about this derivation? I don't uh, see what the uh, phi represents. Yeah, so, <clears throat> okay, I, I'll come back to that point in one second. So, So if I'm, I'm looking yeah, at uh, the expression of the electro electromagnetic field at the point M in the pupil plane, yeah, I find that, well, it's a complex amplitude multiplied by this uh, imaginary term, yeah, well, exponential to account for the vibration yeah, of the field. Yeah. So the, the complex amplitude is this one. And I can say, well, it may be represented as a real part, real amplitude, times this factor which may account for a phase difference. Yeah? And well, this is a phi in question, and I will just explain in a moment yeah, what, what it is about. And now, here I just multiply by a function which is everything or nothing. It means, if I'm in the pupil plane, it's one, if I'm located outside, it's zero. Okay, so let's assume that the pupil is a circular disk. Yeah, if the point is inside the disk, this is one. If I'm outside the disk, it's zero. It's just to define the pupil plane. Yeah. Okay. So I just come back here. So what I know, yeah, is that. To the value yeah, of the electric field here, I will get the contribution of that point. And uh, well, its value yeah, is something like, OK, a real amplitude time, I just said, yeah, a possible phase shift that I shall define in a moment, times this imaginary exponent to account for the time variation of the field. Yeah? But the amplitude is the following one. Yeah? Now I could say, OK, the contribution due to a small uh, surface area dx dy here, well, is that multiplied by dx dy? Now the problem is that, well, I should integrate this yeah, over the, the pupil plane. And I should like to know how this phase shift yeah, varies as I'm moving yeah, from any point to another one in the pupil plane. So I say, okay, I take as a reference point this one. In this, I will say the phase error is zero. Okay? So if the phase there is zero, the phase shift here will be this length 
multiplied by 2 pi divided by lambda. Huh? This is a phase shift, you see? And so what I should do there, I should say, OK, uh, well, the amplitude, yeah? X prime, Y prime, if you want, yeah? The amplitude in the focal plane is just a summation of all the contributions from the pupil plane. So I'm just making a double integration of the real amplitude times the phase shift. Now, if you look at delta, yeah, what I should do, I should say, I must make the subtraction between this length and that length. So the difference is that. But since this is shorter than that one, the difference would be negative. So the delta, in fact, here should be preceded by a minus sign, and here also by a mi minus sign. Yeah, just because I say the relative phase shift yeah, is this phase minus that phase. And since this length is smaller than that length, it will be negative. And it will be minus delta. So here, this will come E minus I times 2 pi times x, x prime plus y, y prime divided by lambda f, dx dy. So this is the expression of the amplitude yeah, of the electric field here, which will also vibrate yeah, with the same frequency. Because well, I should, this factor yeah, goes outside the double integral yeah, and still represents the time dependence of the electric field. Now, when I see that expression, I say, well, <clears throat> it would be useful to make some simplification here to define, for instance, yeah, the variable p as being x prime over lambda f and y prime and q as being y prime over lambda f. So <clears throat> I want to isolate yeah, this factor and this factor. If I do that, I may rewrite yeah, the expression of the amplitude yeah, in the focal plane as a function of P Q, like that, which is equal to a double integration of the distribution of the complex amplitude. Well, and this is a real amplitude in the pupil, pupil plane times e by this i 2 pi now multiplied by px plus qy dx dy and could someone tell me what does this represent yeah so the complex amplitude in the focal plane is equal to is equal to what <laughs> the house is making a shadow uh, So the distribution of a complex amplitude in the focal plane is equal to to the Fourier transform of of the A of the X Y of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane. Yeah. Yeah. So a very simple result. Yeah. OK, now the AXY, XY. the AXY I've shown, well, OK, this is just what I've done on the blackboard. OK, this is the result, yeah? So this is equal to the Fourier transform of that quantity. But you, you, you say I have made a change of variables, yeah? To express, to express it as a Fourier transform, yeah. Okay, first application, yeah. So you will see why, yeah. It is an important theorem.
here. Which we are observing here yeah, is a square area like this. So if you would take the aluminum fold I gave you last time, yeah, instead of making a circular hole, you could have made a square hole, yeah, one millimeter by one millimeter, yeah, very difficult, yeah. So I may represent, yeah, the amplitude, yeah, in the focal plane, assuming that I'm observing a star, yeah, just perpendicularly, yeah, to that pupil. So the wavefront of the star is parallel to the pupil, and I may, yeah, indeed, yeah. Uh, consider that its amplitude is constant over the whole pupil, yeah? So I just say, okay, the amplitude in the pupil plane is a constant times this function, yeah? P0 xy. So this is everything or nothing, yeah? So P0 xy may be represented, you agree, as a product, yeah, of two door functions, yeah? X over A, Y over A, here. And if I apply yeah, that uh, <coughs> result, I find that the distribution of amplitude in the focal plane is equal to the free transform of times A0. Now, a trial, a trial result, yeah, to demonstrate that this may also be rewritten as follows. is a Fourier transform of times the Fourier transform of Y over A times A0. So, <clears throat> you see, the reason why I may separate the variables yeah, is that this function yeah, is yeah, made of two functions with separate, separated variables. Yeah. So I just show it here. So for the transform yeah, of I have double integral x over a y okay so I may rewrite this yeah as So here I just separate the two functions. And after I put this one in front of that one, I put this one in front of that one. And since, since this doesn't depend on y and this doesn't depend on x, yeah, I may rewrite this as being the product times the integration Degree, and this is the Fourier transform of x over a of p, and this is the Fourier transform of the door function, which depends on q. Yes. I have two questions. Yes. First is why we are taking uh, the door function as a function of uh, something scaled version of x, x by a. Yeah. And next question. Yeah. Next question is uh, why the x doesn't depend on y because 
if you see the complex uh, amplitude, uh, it is something constant into a function which is dependent on x and y. So it means that x and y depends on each other. Yeah. So here you see the first first question, yeah. If I take the dual function of x over a, yeah, I know that this is equal to one if x over a is smaller or bigger than one half minus one half, which means that if x is less than a over half, yeah, and you agree? So this is dual function equal to one if x, yeah. Okay, it's exactly w what I see. Yeah? Here is a half and minus a half, so it's correct. And I make the product of the two because then it gives me yes, the correct representation. Yeah? So this was the first question. And now the second question was? Uh, why is the x and y are not independent of each other? They should be independent of each other because the complex amplitude is uh, expression we tell that. Yeah. No. Now the second answer is the following. Here is a pupil, square pupil, yeah. And so what I have assumed, yeah, is that I'm observing a star located vertically at infinity, emitting a wavefront, yeah. So the, the wavefront of the star will falling on the pupil plane, yeah, is just something which is also square, yeah. No atmospheric effect, yeah? So it's corrected, yeah, for any atmospheric turbulence. So it's a correctly plane wave, constant. And of course, it's vibrating, yeah? With the frequency new. But the amplitude all over is the same. Yeah? Because well, the source, of course, at the beginning, emits a spherical wave. Spherical wave getting bigger, 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 bigger. And then here, well, the amplitude is constant, yeah? And we are just sampling with our square aperture a fraction of that sphere, which is more or less plane wave, yeah? But mm -hmm. then that, uh, uh, there will be, it is complex, so there will be vibration also. Oh, but the, the vibrations are accounted for the imaginary exponentiation i to pi nu t, yeah? And what we are looking here is the amplitude. It's amplitude, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not complex amplitude, it's simply the amplitude. Yeah, it's real amplitude, yeah, times, well, complex variation, yeah. So we have this, yeah? Now, we're just a reminder about the similitude, similitude, similitude theorem we have demonstrated last time. We have demonstrated that the Fourier transform, yeah, of uh, x over e, is equal to module A, module of A, times the Fourier transform of the function fx for the variable A times B. You remember? This was a similitude theorem, yeah? So here, I may write that this is equal to A0 times A times the Fourier transform of the door function evaluated for the variable a times p after times a multiplied by the Fourier transform of the door function evaluated for a times q. Now, a second reminder. Last time we have shown yeah, that the Fourier transform of the door functions, yeah, like that, was a sine cardinal, cardinal sine, yeah, it was sine. Agree? So here we find that this is equal to a zero times a square times the sine of times sine of a over q a. 
So this is the expression of the amplitude we find. And now when we are looking at the focal plane, yeah, we are not looking at an amplitude, but we are looking at, at an intensity distribution. And the intensity distribution is the square of the module of the amplitude. Yeah? So we may write here that where the distribution of the intensity is equal to A0 square times the square of A square times the sine square times square. So this is the final answer. In this we could say, OK, this may be represented as a intensity. Reference intensity I zero. So application well, the details here is made in the notes. But what we find is the following: is that given a square pupil, the intensity distribution in the focal plane, which is I depending on the variables p and q, yeah? it's such a shape. Yeah? It's a sine cardinal at the square, yeah? square. And well, it looks almost, well, if you remember, as a hairy, hairy disk, yeah? but which is not circular, which is square. Yeah? So for those students yeah, who have uh, who, who has got a Galileo scope at home, nobody? You? You have one, yeah? So what you could do, you take an aluminum piece of paper, yeah? Then you just uh, make a, so this is a galeoscope, yeah? You cover it with an aluminum sheet, yeah? And just here, you cut a small square, I would say maybe one centimeter by one centimeter, yeah? Then you put it on the foot and you look a tripod, yeah, and you look at a bright star, yeah, and you will see uh, that point spot function. Yeah, so you should not see a hairy disk, yeah, but you should see uh, such a nice, uh, nice image. Something like a cross. Yeah, yeah, something like a cross, yeah, absolutely. Apodice crossed, cross. Now, we would like to know yeah, what is the uh, angular width, yeah, the angular width yeah, of the central image. Because this will define the angular power of your telescope. Yeah? So we will try to estimate now what is the width, angular width yeah, of the central image. Just to get an idea about the Angular, angular resolution of the telescope. So do you agree that, well, the width yeah, of the central image is defined by the value of, well, if you look along that direction, yeah, so it's a, it's a Q, the value for which this function will be equal to zero, and we should look on the opposite side when it will be equal to zero. And we find that this will be equal to zero when PQA will be equal to pi. Yeah? So whenever PQA is equal to plus or minus pi, I will get a minimum. Yeah? So you agree, well, when uh, the argument of the sine is equal to pi, sine will be equal to zero, it will correspond to this point, and on the other side too. So PQA equal plus or minus pi, so pi pi, and I find that Q is equal to plus or minus 1 over A. Yeah? Well, I could say, OK, the, the width, the distance between these two values is equal to 1 over A minus minus 1 over A. So it's 2 over A. This is the width, yeah? The width of the peak in units of Q. Now I know that Q 
is equal to y prime over lambda f, which means that delta y prime over lambda f, yeah, because delta q yeah, will be equal to delta y prime over lambda f. So this is equal to 2 over a. And I find here, finally, that delta y prime over f is equal to twice the wavelength divided by a. So who could comment, yeah? What represents delta y prime over f? Yeah, absolutely. So, if, if you look, yeah, from the center of your lens, yeah, at the image in the focal plane, you see delta y prime, this is the width, divided by the distance, yeah? So, it is the angle under which I see, yeah, the, the two minima on both sides of the central image. Yeah? And what I find, this is angular resolution, yeah? So, this is the angular resolution of my telescope, yeah? that it is equal to twice the wavelength divided by A. Yeah? So bigger will be the square, yeah? better will be the angular resolution. And furthermore, yeah, if you are working yeah, at shorter wavelengths, you improve the angular resolution. Working at 3,000 angstrom instead of 6,000 angstrom yeah, improves angular resolution by a factor two. Yeah? Therefore, yeah, <coughs> the Shara interferometer working at optical wavelengths yeah, is much more powerful yeah, than the VLTI working at infrared wavelengths. There is gain, significant gain here. Yeah. Do you have any question? Or now, a, a nice quantity yeah, to estimate would be the following. Yeah? So I just represent here in, in one dimension. Yeah. Uh, the intensity distribution yeah, in the focal plane. Okay. W what would be interesting yeah, to calculate, yeah? and well, I didn't do that, yeah, but maybe one of you will do it, yeah? is what is a fraction yeah, of energy inside the first peak compared to the rest of the light in the secondary peak. Yeah? So, okay, this value, say, I could say, okay, this is, uh, for instance, Q1, and this is Q2, those values where I have the minima. So, wh what I should do, yeah? Well, I should integrate IPQ dp dq. Well, double integration, of course, yeah? between uh, one and two, divided by the same integration, IPQ, dp, dq, between minus infinity and plus infinity. So if I do this yeah, calculation, I will know what is the fraction of energy yeah, enclosed yeah, in the central image compared to well, the energy yeah, <coughs> distributed all over the field. Well, the difficulty will be to integrate, double integrate, yeah, uh, sine cardinal at the square value. Yeah. So I don't know if it's easy or not. Maybe Leo yeah, knows. <laughs> well, but next time I will ask you yeah, if you found the solution. Or is it necessary to proceed with a numerical calculation? I don't know. Yeah. But it would be interesting to know because I will tell you why later. Yeah. So any question about this first application? No? Yeah. So first minima, first minima, here and here. So just inside here is uh, the first image. So you agree that if I, I, I look yeah, at the pulse plate function yeah, projected on the sky, 
Can I see something like that, yeah? Something like that, yeah? So I should like to know, what is the fraction of energy enclosed here compared to the whole energy scattered here all over the plane? This is the first application, yeah? Okay, now, second application. I think I, I won't make it because I would like to turn to the last application. But a very nice application uh, to make yeah, is the following. Let's assume yeah, that you are not observing a star at the zenith, yeah? but that you are observing a star yeah, which is oriented along another direction. And I would say, OK, the vector normalized vector v pointing to another direction yeah, could have coordinates B over F, C over F, and 1. Yeah, OK? So it's approximately normalized vector. We are looking in another direction. Well, now, what happens, we know. Yeah, What happens is that the, the plane wave coming from that star well, is slightly inclined. It's like that, yeah? And so when it will hit the pupil, so let, let, let's assume that it hits the pupil here. Well, I see that there will be a phase difference now between the different points of the pupil plane, the pupil plane, yeah? We must take into account, yeah, this phase shift, yeah? And, uh, well, perhaps I will do the exercise with you, okay? Yeah? Okay, because, well, I think it is a very important result here yeah, also, which is slightly displaced here yeah, with the vertical position. So what will happen? Let's assume here yeah, that the star, yeah, is just displaced along the x direction, okay? So here I just write zero, one. It's very mo much more simple because then it's a one dimension problem, yeah? So here I represent, so this is a pupil plane with x. Well, this is of course the z direction, yeah? And y equals zero corresponds to the blackboard, yeah? And let's assume you are observing a star. Slightly displaced yeah, with the zenith direction. And I said, well, small vector v, well, I may represent it as having coordinates x over f in 1. What I know is that, OK, the, the plane wave coming from that star is perpendicular to the light rays. Yeah? And now if I'm interested yeah, to know what is the phase difference at this point x, I just need to put the perpendicular here. This is perpendicular. But I know that the direction, this direction, can also be represented by this vector v. So what do I need to do? It's very simple. I need to project on my right. I need to project x on this one. Do you agree? Yeah? So if this is a vector r, and this is vector v, yeah? I just need to make r times v, correct? Well, this is a scalar product. Now, the vector r is for coordinate x and 0. So if, if I multiply the two vectors, yeah? Uh, wait a moment, here it was not x. Huh? I just say it was b over f. 
B over F. So when I make the scalar product of these two vectors, I just add the product of the components. So this would be equal to B over F, B over F times X plus 1 times 0, 0. Now, if I would make yeah, the same exercise in two dimensions, yeah, I would find that R times V is equal to B over F times X plus C over Y divided by F. So I would have assumed here that C over F, OK? Just gener generalization yeah, of that result. Yeah? OK, but now I see that uh, at this point x, yeah, I'm in a phase advance compared to that point. Yeah? So here, this phase difference yeah, should be uh, with a plus sign, not minus. It's a plus. Yeah? Now you can say, OK, the phase difference, in fact, is equal to the phase difference phi. It's equal, so this is a path length difference, is equal to 2 pi multiplied by delta over lambda. So it would be equal to 2 pi times delta b times x over f plus c times y over f divided by lambda. So this is the phase difference between when the plane wave arrives here compared to there. It first arrives here, you agree? And after it hits here. So <coughs> the sign now is plus. So let's calculate again, yeah? What is the distribution of the amplitude, complex amplitude in the focal plane? Well, I know it's a Fourier transform of the distribution of complex amplitude, yeah? In the pupil plane. I may write that it is equal to double integration. Of course, I also assume that the amplitude, real amplitude, is a constant. So, a zero. After I will write e times phi to be times two pi b x over f lambda plus c y over f lambda times you agree now Fourier transform e is two p. P x plus q y dx dy. So I may write this as follows: it's a zero times double integration of e minus i two pi multiplied by. So I'm just uh, thinking, it will be p. Oh, p now minus b over lambda f times x plus q minus c, c over lambda f times y, like this, dx dy. Yeah? And do you agree that this is OK? But that's not, it's not finished. Then I should have written inside, yeah, times this function times this function. You agree? Yeah, I, 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 yeah. the two door functions yeah, must be, of course, placed inside. And then what I find that, well, this is, yeah, if I look at it, yeah, this is simply the Fourier transform of x over a times y over a, not calculated for the value p, but calculated for p minus b over lambda f, and for q minus c over lambda f. Okay. Which means that I find exactly the same result as, as before, yeah? 
except that it has been translated in the focal plane. Yeah? So instead of being centered in p equals 0, q equals 0, now it is centered at p equal b over lambda f and at q equal c over lambda f. Means, huh? So in the first case, huh? so we had a square pupil like that, and we were looking at the star there. Yeah? And now we look here at focal plane. So focal plane is x prime, y prime. So what we find, or maybe I will make it differently. Make like that. Oops. This is x prime, y prime. So what we see, I like this color, lila. So, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And now we have the second situation. So this is optical axis, but now the star is over here. And so what we find now in the focal plane Is it the star? It comes here. It comes here. Now, if I ask you, Leo, what are the coordinates x prime and y prime? So this is y prime, and this is x prime. What are the values? So look, to, to find out, yeah? We, we know that this, the star is going to be centered in P equal B over lambda F and in Q equal C over lambda F. Well, we know that P, by definition, is X prime divided by lambda F. And Q is equal to Y prime over lambda F. Now, if you identify these two and these two, you find, of course, that x prime equal b, y prime equal c. Yeah. yeah. So x prime is equal to b, and y prime is equal to c. Mm -hmm. And this was expected because uh, I selected the direction as being b over f and c over f. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is our angle. So if I would like to now to know linear distance, I multiply this by the focal length. And I find these two values. Yeah. So, well, but this is very nice. Yeah, a demonstration that when you are observing yeah, the star slightly displaced with a respect to the perpendicular to the pupil, what happens in the focal plane is that the response function is simply shifted by translation, but it's identical, identical shape. Yeah, the shape is identical, but it is centered at a different location. Yes? And this will be true, of course, if you take a circular aperture, a triangular aperture, or whatsoever. Yeah? It's always a translation. And well, a good optical system, a very good optical system, is a system which preserves yeah, the point spread function all over the field. And in practice, Oh, it's not always the case, but if it is a high quality optical system, it is the case. So you have to pay for that. <laughs> yes? The Fourier transform of the bigger uh, distribution uh, and the uh, is a translation basis. Uh, it's a focal plane. Yeah. So translation will be uh, effective in two directions, right? Yes, in two directions, yeah. So how can we so sure that it, 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 is the, the, it will the whole image at focal plane will be shifted? You know, one square sync, sync function can be somewhere else and other sync function can be somewhere else. No, no, no. Because, well, <coughs> 
Okay, this is amplitude, yeah? Now if I take the intensity, I take the square of the module of this Fourier transform, yeah? So you see, th this is exactly the same function. It's just the location which is different. But the function is not affected at all, not at all. I'm not so, it's so, location the function. Yes? It is affected, right? No, it's not affected. Oh, well, you see, before, when, when I was taking b equals 0, I had this, q equals 0, I had this. Yeah? So, in that case, yeah, I mean this configuration. So it is centered in p equals zero, q equals zero. Yeah, yeah. We, we saw that when I have p equals zero, q equals zero, the sign cardinals is equal to one one. Yeah. Okay. Now in this case, I found that it is p minus b over f and minus c over lambda f. Yeah. So it is slightly translated, and that's all, yeah? But the shape is constant, it's the same, it's not affected. It's a real a mild translation. Yeah, we will we, we may discuss that later again, yeah? yeah? Okay. Now comes, uh, I would say, the most interesting part, yeah? But also the most difficult. You ready? Yes. Okay, now the question is that, well, usually yeah, the aperture, the mirrors are not square. They are circular, yeah? And usually they are represented yeah, by this ring because uh, always above the prime mirror, you have a secondary mirror, yeah? And the secondary mirror causes some obstruction of the light so it is as if yeah, you're only using an annular part of your prime, prime mirror. So, okay, what, what, what we should do, yeah, we should uh, invoke a door function going from radius R1 to radius R2. Yeah? So it's one all over that and zero outside. Yeah? And what, what we'll find out still is that, okay, the intensity distribution is a focal plane, yeah? is the square of the Fourier transform of the distribution of the complex amplitude in the pupil plane, yeah? And we will find, of course, yeah, the airy disk function, yeah, airy disk function, yeah? So I'm quite sure that no one of you has ever done that, yeah? Did you in your optical course? No. But I think it's important to make it once in your life, yeah? So it will be today, yeah. <laughs> Okay, before doing it, yeah, I have to come with some reminders, yeah? Well, important properties of the Bessel functions. Okay. Well, the def definition of the zero order Bessel function, J0x, is the following. It's one over pi, integration from zero to pi, cosine of this argument, which is x times sine theta, d theta. Now, for any order higher, the real definition is the following one. And you see, well, it also applies for n equals zero. But now there is an interesting property as you go to the first order Bessel function, you find that the first order Bessel function is this expression divided by x, and this is the integration of x prime times yeah, the zero order Bessel function. Yeah. So I should just write those properties here. g 0 x is equal to one over pi, integration zero over pi, cosine of x times sine theta d theta. Now, interesting properties here yeah, is the following, yeah, that the integration of x prime times a zero order Bessel function is equal to x 
by this one. And here are the graphs yeah, of the zero and first order Bessel functions. Yeah? So you see that the zero order Bessel functions look like a sine cardinal. Yeah? Rather than the first order function yeah, is different, it's zero in zero. And now an interesting property yeah, is that you may develop yeah, in a series Taylor the first order Bessel function. If you do that, yeah, you see that it behaves as x over 2 minus x to the power 3, etc. Such that if I divide j1x over x, so if I divide this expression by x, you see that it behaves as 1 half minus x squared. Yeah, but x is, being, is very small, so it's almost 0. So it behaves like one half. Yeah? So this is very important to remind that this happens if x is much smaller than one. OK? So these are nice properties that we shall use in a moment. OK, I come back to the graphs yeah? here. And let's start here the, the demonstration. So we have to do the following integration for a circular aperture. So because of the circular symmetry, yeah, we use polar coordinates. Yeah. So let's define yeah, x equal rho times cos theta, then y equal rho times since sine theta, then this is in the cubic plane. Now in the focal plane, let's define x prime equal rho prime times cos theta prime, y prime equal rho prime times sine theta prime. And now when I take the Fourier transform, yeah, well, I have that uh, LPQ is equal to the double integration. And now instead of integrating over x and y, I will integrate over rho and theta. Yeah? So <coughs> you agree that in rho, I will integrate from R1 to R2. Now in theta from 0 to 2 pi. So this takes into account the yes, door function yeah, in radius. And now, well, e minus i 2 pi. And now I have, yeah, if you remember, it's x times p. But p is equal to x prime over lambda f. And Q is equal to Y prime over lambda F. Yeah? So it means that here I will have yeah? minus I2 pi. Then I will have rho rho prime over lambda F times cos theta cos theta prime plus sine theta sine theta prime, yeah? and that's not all, time rho d rho times d theta. Yeah? So you, you see, yeah? here I had a p times x, so it's p times x, where x prime is given by that expression. Yeah? So here it comes. Now, who in who remembers, yeah? Cos cos plus sine sine, yeah? Cos uh, squared theta minus plus here yeah, minus cos squared theta minus cos squared theta plus sine squared theta plus. So, what do you say here? Cos theta minus theta prime. So once more, cos? Cosine theta minus theta prime. Yeah, he says cos theta minus theta prime. Yes. Who? You say yes, Leo. No. 
is there is no square. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, this is equal to cos theta minus theta prime. Yeah. So good point. <laughs> Here. Yeah. Okay. So cos theta minus theta prime. Yeah. Now we'll make the following change of variable. I will define, yeah? Well, a new variable, big theta, is being equal to half pi minus theta minus theta prime. Okay? So if I do that, yeah? Well, we find that d theta is equal to minus d big d theta. And I find that this expression reduces to integration from R1 to R2. Now, I should not go from 0 to 2 pi, because I've made this. Yeah? So it will be half pi here minus theta minus theta prime, like that, okay? And here it will be half pi minus four half pi, so it will be minus three half pi. Uh, yeah, so here it's, uh, I think it's correct. And then minus theta minus theta prime. You agree? Times e minus i2 pi rho rho prime over lambda f. Now, <coughs> now from this relation here, yeah, we find that theta minus theta prime theta minus theta prime is also equal to half pi minus big theta. Yeah? So when I, I take the cosine of this, I'll find that it will be equal to the sine of theta. So this will be equal times sine big theta. And now d theta and with a minus sign here. Il ne veut pas y être. Non, absolument. Alors attends, <coughs> let's. So we have theta. The big theta is equal to. Yeah, I agree with you. So here it's plus theta prime, correct? In here, plus theta prime. Yes or no? Okay, so I find that a pq is equal to integration from r1 to r2. Then I integrate from minus 3 half pi plus theta prime to plus half pi plus theta prime. And now I just rewrite this as a summation of yeah, a cosine. So it would be cosine of 2 pi rho rho prime over lambda f times the sine big theta d theta. plus integration from R1 to R2. Here I have a i, the minus i, minus i, of sine of 2 pi rho rho prime over lambda f times the sine of theta D theta. And here I have to integrate from 
minus 3 of 5 is the prime to of pi plus theta prime. Like this. Okay? I try to find the. Uh... Yeah, it's nice. Okay, now you will see. I will make some simplification. Look, here I go from. Let's assume that theta prime is at angle, yeah? Theta prime is at angle. So I come from plus theta prime minus 3 half pi. So I go here minus 3 half pi, about here. And I integrate up to half pi plus theta prime. Okay, half pi plus theta prime will be exactly the same point, yeah? So it means I'm integrating, yeah, over R 2 pi, yeah, this, this quantity. It means that here, look what I do. I take here 0, and here I just write to 2 pi, because it doesn't depend. Yeah, if I start here, and integrate here or here, integrate there, it's exactly the same, yeah? So I do the same here. So it will be from 0 to 2 pi. Now, do we agree that when we shall integrate from 0 to 2 pi, yeah, half the time this sign will be positive, half the time this sign will be negative. Yeah? But here I have also a sign, yeah, which means that once everything will be positive, once everything will be negative. So in total, this will be identically equal to zero. Here, fortunately, I have a cos, yeah? which means that once it will be negative, then after it will be positive. But since I have the cos, yeah? this is equal simply to the integration from zero to two pi multiplied here by two. In some ways, there is already some nice simplification. And I draw your attention yeah, to this expression. Yeah? Well, I see a cos of an argument where I have the sign from 0 to 2 to pi, so it's very good. So what we need to do now, we just divide this by pi, but we have to multiply it by pi yeah, to, to remain constant. And now I shall define a new variable. Maybe I will call it z z equal 2 pi rho rho prime over lambda f like this and then I may write that the distribution of complex amplitude in the vocal plane is equal to 2 pi integration from z of r1 to z of R2 of what? I just look there of a zero order function which depend here it's Z times the sine theta D theta Is it correct or not? Excuse me? The sign data will come into the picture. Only x should be there, means only z should be there. Yeah, so if z here, then here I have a dz. Well, it's a d rho, yeah? Now, d rho is equal to lambda f over 2 pi rho prime dz. You agree? D rho yes. equal lambda f over 2 pi rho prime then dz. So here I should multiply by dz. Now by lambda f 
over 2 pi rho pi. And here, if you look very well, yeah, here I have this, eh, rho zero. So here one rho is, was missing. Here one rho was missing. So I should still add one rho. And so the rho should be lambda f of over 2 pi rho pi times z. Okay? So <coughs> this was the forgotten uh, rho here huh? that I recently inserted here. Here's here, and then rho. Yeah, I find that it's a lambda half of our two pi rho prime times z, and the z yeah, comes here. Now let's look yeah, at this second line here. I see that this should be equal to 2 pi times lambda f over 2 pi rho prime squared yeah? multiplied by this will be a first order Bessel function of z of r2 times z of r2 minus g1 of z of r1 times z of r1. Do you agree with that or Now what I do, look here, I divide here by z over r2. Here I put it square. I divide here by z of r1 and I put it square here. And finally I find that it's equal to 2 pi multiplied by lambda f over 2 pi rho prime square multiplied by so I have here j1 z of r2 over z of r2 and here this one I shall develop yeah so I see that the z square area yeah, r2 will be exactly equal to 2 pi rho prime over lambda f square times R2 square and now here minus R1 square times J1 of Z of R1 divided by Z of R1 like this. Now I see nice constellations yeah, this and this yeah are just equal and this is uh, just what remains you see that the variable pq yeah? pq yeah? <coughs> f uh, somewhat dis disappeared but p just as a reminder was x prime over lambda f and x prime was rho prime cosinus theta prime over lambda f yeah? And you see that there is no more theta prime here, yeah? What remains via the z is rho. Rho prime, rho prime, yeah? So I may write here simply that the distribution of intensity is a focal plane, which only depends on rho prime, not on theta prime. And this is because of the circularity, yeah? Of the PSF is equal to of course, yeah, uh, I would say a rho prime module square. 
And I will just consider the case, you know, when I, do, I have no obstruction yeah, by a secondary. So I shall forget this term, yeah, for the moment. So I just retain this one. So I find that it will be equal, if there is no mistake, 2 pi squared time R2 at the power 4 time G1 of Z of R2 divided by Z of R2. Yeah, with Z of R2 equal to 2 pi rho, oh no, rho pi R2 divided by lambda f. Okay? And here I forgot to take this square. What is interesting, look what I'm doing now. The two from here, yeah? The two from here, I put it here, okay? Two. And I find, and finally, that the <coughs> Ponsfeld function that I observed in the focal plane, which is the airy disk, yeah? the airy disk, has the following expression. It is pi. Well, the radius, okay, of uh, of the aperture square times two g1 z of r, where r represents yeah, the the radius of the aperture divided by z of r, and this is square. Now, what is the maximum intensity that I observe? Yeah, well, this is obtained for rho equal to zero, rho prime equal to zero. Yeah, well. I know that when rho prime equal to zero, uh, or x goes to zero, that j1 over x yeah, is about one half. Yeah? Which means that this quantity j1 of z over z, it goes on like one over two. So two divided by two, it's one. Yeah? So I see that the maximum intensity is equal to the square of the surface of the collecting area. This is the surface of the mirror, you see? So this is what you see here, yeah? Because R1, uh, I did not consider here, yeah? So this is maximum intensity. And now the first minimum here, yeah? Is obtained for what? Well, when the first order Bessel function gets to zero, yeah? In this I forgot to write, yeah? this happens for uh, x equal to 3.9. Yeah? When x equal to 3.9, the first order Bessel function goes to zero. Yeah? I may show it to you later. So I may say when uh, z of r, so this quantity, yeah? is equal to 3.9, yeah. I'm getting a zero value. Yeah? Okay, now I may rewrite this expression as follows, yeah? Do you agree that two times the radius, well, is the diameter of the telescope, yeah? So I find that pi times rho pi times the diameter of the telescope divided by lambda f is equal to 3.9, yeah? And from here, I deduce that rho prime divided by f is equal to 3.9 divided by pi multiplied by lambda over d. Yeah? And when you divide 3.9 by pi, yeah, you find that this is equal to 1.22. So this is 1.22. So now can you comment the result, yeah? So we find that rho prime over f, what, what it, does it represent? Angular, yeah, it's the angular radius between the maximum and the first minimum, yeah? Is equal to 1.22 times lambda over d, yeah? Which means that if I would, like, if I would calculate yeah, the width here, yeah, the width between the two minima, 
Well, I would find that the delta rho prime over f, yeah, would be equal to 2, 44 lambda over d. Yeah? And before, yeah, when we were considering a square aperture, yeah, we were finding that this quantity was equal to 2 lambda over d. And now we find that for a circular aperture, yeah, it is 2, 44 lambda over d. Yeah? So now a question for you. Let's assume that I have the same area, same number of uh, square centimeters. Yeah? Is it more beneficial to use a square aperture or a circular one in terms of angular resolution? Square? You say square? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we should check. And intuitively, I would say also square, but the same, we should have the same area. So we should have. Oh, yeah. So well, we, we must have a square equal to our square. Yeah? So in terms of angular resolution, what is the best? Yeah? Um, yeah, but a definite answer? Yeah. yeah? So who, who wants to bet? <laughs> okay, for next time, yeah, next lecture, yeah, you will tell me if you agree with that. Now, just to terminate, yeah. Okay, I show you once more, yeah, this diagram that the first order Bessel function yeah, gets null for the value of x equal to 3.9. Yeah? So you see. OK. So this is a demonstration in the notes, the results. Yeah. And, and, and now it's, here it's easier. Yeah? If you ask me, yeah, what is the concentration of light in the central peak? compared to the whole energy distributed in the focal plane, you make this calculation and you find that it is 84%. Yeah? So I'm just curious to know what is the answer for the square aperture. Yeah? Is it better or is it worse? So next time you will tell me. Yeah? You will calculate. Huh? You will calculate. Yeah? And that's all for today. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs>